Hi everyone, welcome back to the course on quantum theory of many body systems and condensed matter. My name is Luis Gregor Diaz. I'm a professor here at the Institute of Physics at the University of Sao Paulo. So today's class is going to be introduction to BCS theory. So we're finalizing our series on electron phonon interactions and, and, and leading to, to BCS. So we're going to start this class uh, by talking about Cooper pairs and then uh, writing down the microscopic model for BCS, the boarding cooper schrieffer theory. Then we're going to do the mean field solution for BCS, essentially through a Bogolubov transformation. We're going to diagonalize the, the mean field uh, Hamiltonian. And also we're going to uh, do an alternate approach to the mean field solution using matsubara greens functions where from this we can get a, an expression for the order parameter, the, the so-called uh, order or gap parameter, if you want, that appears in, in, in BCS and can be written in terms of the parameters going in into the mean field solution. And then we're going to discuss what does that mean, what, what does the appearance of this gap uh, tells us about the microscopic prop the macroscopic properties of this model so let's get right into it okay so let's start by talking about cooper pairs and the so-called cooper pair wave function so in the previous class we talked about the cooper instability saying that um, when you have the this combination of electron phonon and electron electron interaction it, there can be uh, an effective attractive electron-electron interaction mediated by the phonons. And we saw that if you have the pair scattering amplitude for two electrons with opposite momenta and opposite spin, then this amplitude can diverge below a certain critical temperature, meaning that in that, in that case, these two electrons would tend to form a bound state. They would the attraction would be so so large that they would not scatter. They would effectively form a bound state. So here, let, let's take another look at this bound state. Right, where sometimes and well, most of the times is called the Cooper pair in this in this language. And the formation of this bound state has these two ingredients, right? The first is this Hamiltonian for, say, free electrons, an electron gas. And here I'm writing uh, the energies relative to the Fermi energy or to the chemical potential in, at, at non-zero temperature. But uh, so this can be positive if you have, if you have states above the Fermi, the Fermi energy or the Fermi outside the Fermi sphere, or it can be negative if you have uh, states below the Fermi sphere. All right. And the other, the other ingredient is this effectively attractive interaction, be two, two, two body interaction between the electrons, right? And then the, the Hamiltonian that has, has these two ingredients would then allow me to to describe this Cooper pair. That's what I'm calling it, H Cooper pair, okay? So let's try to define the Cooper pair wave function. As I mentioned, uh, the states that are scattering and that cause that Cooper instability, right? The, the divergence of the pair scattering amplitude are related to each other by time reversal symmetry. So if one electron is going at with a momentum case and spin up, the it will interact attractively with another electron with momentum minus case and spin down. So the resulting bound state has zero momentum, zero momentum and zero spin, zero total spin. So it forms a spin singlet. So it would be this state would be a combination, typically a, a, kind of a combination of you know sum over case of states like this, right? Creating an electron with minus case spin down and 
another one with plus k spin up over the ground state of the electron gas. And as I said in this uh, uh, idea here, or in this notation, this state has zero energy. So it is an eigenstate of H0 with zero energy. That's a ground state. Okay. All right. So uh, what's the energy related to the state? In fact, we can calculate, calculate it, and it still will be an eigenstate of this uh, Hamiltonian. In fact, this is is has a well-defined energy even without the the fact of attraction. And one of the points in the assignment for this class is for you to calculate the the, the energy in the absence of the Coulomb, repo, uh, Coulomb the attractive Coulomb potential. Right, if I apply H naught to this state, what's the energy? And you're going to figure out that it's essentially twice the energy for right a, a single particle state k, two times epsilon k. But notice that here I'm creating this uh, this pair above the Fermi energy, right? So the momenta involved here they are. Uh, above the, the Fermi momenta, which, you know, in, in here in this language would be, well, it's not zero. Sorry, this, this is not correct. It's is whatever Kf here, but the energy relative to to Kf is going to be zero. All right. So this, yeah, this, I'm, I'm going to remove that. It's not zero. Uh, the momentum, it's not zero. It's just the energy that is shifted. Okay. But not the momentum, of course. So, uh, apart from that, let's notice that there, there will be a, uh, an energy associated with this state, which, as I mentioned, in the absence of the electron-electron attraction will be positive. But let's see what, what happens when you include the electron-electron uh, attraction. So, here, this is a two-body uh, potential, right? And this is a two-body wave function too, right? It, it creates two uh, uh, extra particles over over the ground state. So if I take this matrix element, you give me a number, VKK prime, and we're going to use the same um, the same structure, the same approximation for this attractive potential that we used in the last class. And I'll, I'll try to put the link to, to the previous class over here. And which was that this is attractive for energies or for frequencies below the Debye frequency, right? And it will be zero otherwise. And we encode this in here by adding these weights, W of K, saying that uh, this... If this is in absolute values less than omega d, then omega d by, right? This can be positive or negative, right? We're around the, the, the Fermi energy. Uh, this will contribute to, 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 the, to the effective interaction. And it will not uh, contribute if this is larger in absolute value than the by frequency note 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 that the, the by energy is much less than the fermi energy so this should be okay so it's like a shell of uh, with uh, two omega d around the fermi energy that's the the electrons that will essentially contribute to this interaction all right so you can, in principle, calculate this energy, and that's actually uh, it's going to be in the assignment. And in the presence of this attractive potential, you you notice that this energy is not positive; is actually negative. So uh, it 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 is actually a more favorable for the electrons to form this Cooper pair than to to stay. Uh, as independent particles, like as described by this Hamiltonian. So this will actually lower the energy of this state. 
it's going to be negative and uh, you, you can you can see that you know if, if you have this V times the density of states at the Fermi energy a number much less than one and we'll come back to that later uh, this will behave like you know as the the critical temperature that you cal calculate in the previous class something that's proportional to the the by frequency times an exponential that depends on precisely this factor and this is essentially the result that we got and now we can we can relate this energy this Cooper pair formation energy right in absolute values to that critical temperature that that we had before right so whenever you 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 have that critical uh, potential uh, the temperature below that critical potential something will happen here and there will be uh, uh, Cooper pair formation with an energy that's precisely the same order of magnitude right okay and this will also be related to the so-called semiconductor gap. But the, the important point here is that even in the simple model, we got we get uh, a bound state with a negative energy. So it is truly a bound state of two electrons with opposite momentum and opposite spin. So the next step is then to take this two-body interaction to be actually an electron-electron interaction and write a microscopic model for that, right? So, and, and now we want to calculate the properties and not, not only, you know, the, the energy of that state, but what, what happens uh, to the many-body problem when you, when you have this, this interacting part. Well, it turns out that um, due to to, for instance, that Cooper instability and, and, and other things that uh, this is a, a hard problem to, to solve. It's a uh, full interacting many body problem. And so, one of the first things that we try to do, and which we cover in, in a previous class, there should be a link here, is to do the mean field approximation. So as we discussed there, uh, the mean field approximation would amount to this. So I would define a order parameter, right? Would would be then say an expected value of two of these terms, and then leave the the other ones. Uh, as uh, as the momentum and then try to self consistently figure out what's the the order parameter as I, I keep solving the the problem so the order parameter that I'm going to to choose is related to the amplitude of that Cooper pair formation that we discussed before so essentially the expected value of the Cooper pair operator notice that here I have it could be the, the start of this but would be like dagger say CK up dagger C minus K down dagger so this would be the the parameter the which then essentially calculates the expected value for the formation of that, that Cooper pair okay these are states with opposite momentum and opposite spin. Now, if I define this order parameter as, as in this way, with this minus sign and, and VKK prime, then my mean field uh, Hamiltonian becomes uh, this, right? We we take the we take this to be, and we did the calculation in the in, the, in that class on on the mean field approximation and it would be something like the uh, expected value of this this times this expected value times the other way around right so the expected value of this times uh, the other operators 
and and then there will be a cross term here as well so i encourage you to to go back and, and look at the at the class on the mean field approximation where we did this for say the anderson model as well and and see that uh, if you disregard the extra term there will appear here which, which will be just a constant with no operators that's what you get and this is a quadratic hamiltonian with some some funny things here uh, the first is to realize that there is a minus sign here so uh, notice that this will ha have also a minus sign from there so notice that this will be will have a positive positive number or positive numbers times this expected value here so just keep that in mind it's going to be important later the other thing is that this there's something odd about this this Hamiltonian in the sense that it looks like it doesn't conserve the number of particles while this one it certainly does right because this I you know if I take this commutes with the total number of particles uh, here as well uh, due to the fact that I define my my order parameter in this way what I get is is in mean field I'm uh, something is happening and I'm not gonna go much deeper into this in in this class maybe I'll do another video in the future uh, going more over this but the interesting feature of this mean field Hamiltonian is that it at this mean field level does definitely doesn't conserve the number of particles uh, and more importantly it breaks its potentials break a u1 symmetry of the operators uh, this uh, is a feature of mean field approximations right we have these spontaneous spontaneous symmetry breaking of of the original hamiltonian and we saw that occurring in in, in the anderson model as well and here the the symmetry is is more subtle is a u1 symmetry it means that if you in this Hamiltonian if you take uh, any of these operators and multiply by a by a phase e to the i theta then the Hamiltonian will be invariant un, under this u1 uh, transformation right so this would get e to the i theta the, here I'll, I'll get e to the minus i theta and this term would be invariant the same with this but here no here it doesn't you you would have to change the the phase of the order parameter as well in order to ensure the symmetry and, and maybe the order parameter chooses picks a phase and stays with it and you know that that you, you want symmetry is, is spontaneously broken so uh so yeah just to mention this uh i might i might record a video on going further in, in, into this u1 symmetry breaking later okay but this is the mean field uh, bcs hamiltonian uh, very famous where you have the singlet pair formations at its core and the thing is how do we solve it right so let's try to to see what we can do so the first approach we're going to consider is, is the so-called Bogolyubov transformation. After all, this is a quadratic Hamiltonian, and in principle, I should be able to diagonalize it, right? So we choose a basis and just write a big, big matrix, diagonalize it in a computer, and, and you get the excitations. But there's a, a very uh, elegant way to diagonalize this, this this Hamiltonian in analytical form and we actually saw how to do it in in an assignment if you go back to assignment 6 we did precisely this Bogolyubov transformation for a Hamiltonian which is a little bit more simplified than this one but uh, it, I mean the the idea would be precisely the same now uh, the transformation involves the rot rotation if you want in the space of C k and with, with a given spin which is uh, this rotation so i define two other uh, fermionic operators for each k right so for each k i have two other operation operators 
uh, gamma k up gamma k down and here I'm writing how gamma k up and gamma dagger minus k down relate to ck up and c dagger minus k down of course from this you can you can figure out what what would be uh c k c minus k down and and or c minus k up right or c dagger k up as well but so that's why I, i'm i'm only doing uh this transformation is usually done uh in in this form some some people actually put a minus sign here well then this the matrix would be a little bit different but let's stick with this one and see what you get so uh if you go back and retrace what you did in any assignments there will be a condition here over these energies and k's and these u's and v's uh but once and and th this condition is, is is essentially what is going to be your self-consistent condition to to get uh, this correct but if you go back there and recalculate this you, you're gonna diagonalize this Hamiltonian you'll be a sum of a energy with a capital E here which is a function of K but not not on the spin right so the the, the transformation is spin variant if you want uh, and this would be simply a quadratic terms of Bogoli these Bogoliubov operators. So this is is a number of these Bogoliubov excitations, sometimes called the Bogoliubons, plus a constant. So this is diagonal in, in this basis, right? And these are fermions, so there's a, uh, you can count the number of, of these fermions. So this Hamiltonian conserve even though it doesn't conserve the, the, the number of electrons it does conserve the number of Bogolyu bonds right these these excitations here so if you do the actual calculation uh, you're going to see that uh, the the energy is related to the, these u's and v's uh, and to the original parameters as this so this is essentially the square root of the square of this one plus this delta k square uh, absolute value square right so if delta k is zero i will go back to the this hamiltonian and this this should be just a diagonal transformation right uh now or well you can see it by here so if e, big e k equal to epsilon k this the v's are zero and the the u k's are one right and so you get just an identity here which makes sense but if delta k is not zero what i, what I get is something like this uh, uh this is just simplification where it take take this to be a constant but this might depend on k but if if this is a constant what you get here is a gap right so this does not go all the way to to zero right even here i'm, I'm setting the 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 fermi energy to be zero so you can you can see this well above the fermi energy right and of course it's quadratic for for large values of k but there is this energy gap so this this hamiltonian does not describe a metal anymore right it it, ha it describes something else where you have you, you, where you do have a gap meaning that there's no states for um uh for the for this region here uh the energy for uh in in order for for me to to acquire say a zero momenta momentum excitation is not zero but is zero is, is some finite value right so i cannot create excitations with energies below this 
energy gap, which is essentially delta, right? All right. So how, how do I determine then delta and, and in a self-consistent way, right? So I, I diagonalize it, but I need to know delta. And to get delta, I need to know uh, the solution to the Hamiltonian and, and so on and so, so forth. So there's a self-consistency equation, right? So let's see how does that work in, in, in the, the blackboard. We're going to derive this, this expression which relates delta with EK, right? And EK depends on delta, so there's a self-consistency cycle that you can get here. Other than that, everything depends on, on the parameters, except for these U, U's and V's, which, not surprisingly, do depend on epsilon K as well. So here, if I, if I set epsilon K, I calculate this, calculate delta, recalculate it, e, uh, uh, EK, Recalculate this, recalculate delta, and so on. But let's let's get to this self-consistent expression. Let's go to the blackboard. All right. So we have the the main ingredients to derive that self-consistent uh, relation that we had before. We have the expression for the gap, right? Minus sum over k prime v k k prime, and then the expected value of the Cooper pair. Uh, operator C well the destruction operator the Cooper pair C minus K prime down C K prime up and we have the Bogolubov uh, operators here which since uh, U square plus V square is one and you can this is a unitary transformation you know, to invert this is simply to to transpose and and dagger it. Okay, so I get u here, u dagger here, minus v, v k dagger. Right. So then I I invert this and write the c case in terms of these gamma case. One important thing: notice that these these gammas are not Cooper pairs, right? So uh, we can see that uh, this is a the Cooper pair is a two-body state, and these are single particle states. So the a combination of electrons hole and holes, right? So keep that in mind. All right, but let's let's move on. We can now express these two terms that go into my gap like this. So C K up is U K times gamma K up minus V K gamma dagger minus K down. Right, and uh, you can calculate also the c k c minus k down. Right, you can either take this one and and take the dagger, right, or or you can you can uh, revert the the sine of k and and take and use the fact that u of minus k equals to u k and v of minus k equals to minus v. Either way, you, you're going to get this. So now we can substitute this into the, this expression, or at least try to calculate this, right? First, C minus K down times C K up. And you get the, this expression that involves both terms in which are conserved the number of Bogolubons, like this one and this one. But right, like this is actually one minus uh, gamma dagger minus k down gamma minus k down. So it, it also conserves. But this one it doesn't conserve the number of Bogolu bonds. And we remember that our Hamiltonian, the the BCS uh, is a sum of k. E k gamma dagger k sigma. There's a sigma here. Gamma k sigma. So it commutes with the number of Vogelu bonds. So it conserves n gamma. Okay. So any term that does not conserve n gamma 
when I take the expected value will be zero. So let's keep going. So now I, I s replace this expression into there and then only consider the terms which conserve the number of Bogolyubonds, bonds, this one and this one, and there's be a, there are going to be a constant here, right? Well, I'm, I'm including there. So this will be uh, my delta of k, right? And notice that th this is a single particle states of fermions, right? So these thermal averages here of the number, right? The number that I wrote there, uh, this is just a number operator, will be uh, essentially the Fermi direct distribution appearing here. So the final result will be something like that. I have this uh, minus u k v k that's what enters in here right in both of these terms u k v k and i'll have two and the fermi direct distributions with a given energy e k minus one this one this one comes from from here right so also constant and this will essentially give me my self-consistent uh condition right if I if I am given e k, I can calculate u v and the Fermi Dirac distribution and calculate delta. With delta, I get e k and so on and so forth. All right, so let's go back to the slide. So this is the first approach, the Bogoliubov transformation, and now uh, let's try to derive uh, these results in a more say a self-consistent approach that doesn't depend on these u u's and k's using the matsubara greens functions formalism it's, co it's completely equivalent but uh, uses a different language okay so the second approach involves these two matsubara greens functions related to the Hamiltonian. one is the usual uh, matsubara green functions for propagation of, of electrons, right? So here I'm, I'm choosing one of the spins, taking it, it to be spin up, for instance. That is, the uh, then I essentially create a spin down at time, a spin up with momentum k, with a time, an imaginary time tau equals zero, or, well, tau is, is real, it's just that the, the t i tau is, is, is imaginary. So at tau equals zero and destroy it at tau, at time tau, time order this, this product. So tau can be in principle negative as well. But uh, here we're only considering uh, the time ordering. So whatever comes in here will have a positive tau. And, and then take the the expected value, the thermal expected value with a minus sign here, right? So this the usual matsubara greens functions for up electrons in this Hamiltonian. Now, I'm also defining these other matsubara greens functions which involves the pair, the Cooper pair, right? With momentum, one particle created with, with momentum k and a particle destroy, created as well with a momentum minus k and opposite spin at time tau. So that's another um, much about the green functions which we can define. Now I'm going to take the Fourier transform of these in frequency domain and I'm actually going to show that I can calculate this explicitly. Uh, and this will involve the, the total energy, that EK that we obtained by the Boglubov transformation. So this is uh, essentially that's, that's where the poles of these electron Green's functions are. So that essentially diagonalizes the, the, the problem. So that's step one. And step two, we're, we're going to see that we can use these Matsubara Green's functions in this form to get an expression for or a self-consistent expression for the gap. So let's see how we derive these 
uh, these Matsubara Green's functions in this the Matsubara frequencies uh, domain, so with the Fourier transform of those. So let's go to the back blackboard and see how this is done. Okay, so this is the the Hamiltonian. I wrote it down here again, and the, these are the, the two Matsubara Green's functions. So let's start start by calculating the time, the equations of motions for for these Matsubara Green's functions, uh, which is something like this. So the equation of motion for an operator in imaginary time it works pretty much like the equation of motion that we saw uh, in the Heisenberg picture. And if you, uh, there, there should be a link here to the the video on equations of motions for the Heisenberg picture, and in particular for the Green's functions. And here, essentially, there is no i in in front of the commutator. But for a given operator in 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 the Heisenberg picture, but in imaginary time, this is the, the what the equation of motions looks like. So you have to take the commutator of the Hamiltonian and the operator and write this right in in the Fourier, no, not not the Fourier, in the Heisenberg picture for imaginary time. So which is something like this. So let me write write that out there. Uh, something like this. A tau equals e to the h tau a e to the minus h tau. Okay. All right. So. The first thing we need to do, then we want to calculate the time derivative of these green functions. Notice that the only thing that depends on tau here is this operator, so we want to take the commutator of these two with the Hamiltonian. And the expressions are here, you can do it by yourself, but essentially, you know, you, we, we have done plenty of these commutator uh, calculations, so yeah, we you, you, you should be able to do it, right? So you just have to, to use a fermionic uh, algebra to get this, uh, say, CK through the, the Hamiltonian or this way and then calculate the commutator. But that, essentially that's what you get. And you can see that, say, say that we're, we're calculating C times, times H, uh, Whenever I, I hit a, a dagger there, I'll get a one, right? One minus the the, the exchange, the C dagger. See, C, C dagger is one minus C dagger C. So there will be a one or a delta function, right? This would be prime. So I get this an E times C. Here is, is, is not C commutator with H is the opposite, so I get this minus sign. And here I, I hit I hit this delta function when I get to this point, right? So if I get C K up, I get a delta function when it when this guy meets this one. And I what's left is this other one, C K. C minus K dagger spin down. So that's the reasoning. And you can you can see the th same thing happening here, but for the dagger case. Alright, so that's why you get notice that now you know, this commentary involves both non-dagger and dagger operators. All right, let's keep moving. So next step is to to take the time derivative of the Green's functions, and I, I mentioned uh, the way to do it, uh, very similar to the case of the retarded Green's function that we did. So there will be a delta function and time here, times of course a delta function in i and j, right? The, the indices of these two operators. And then there will be the a term that depends on the time evolution of this guy, which is the commutator of, not the, sorry, not the commutator, the time order of the commutator of this with h here at time tau times the, the other operator at time zero. So, uh, here, if I now take the derivative of g, 
there will be definitely a, a delta delta function since these two indices are the same right k up k up so there's this minus delta tau uh, then there will be the the commutators of this guy with h right so there will be minus epsilon k then c k up at time tau c k up dagger at time zero so that's the green's function itself and here there will be what there will be delta k times minus tau t this at time tau which is minus k dagger down at time tau and this one up c k up dagger zero which is precisely uh, what do we have for F? So this the equations of motions of G involves F and if we calculate the equations of motions of F by the same token It will involve G. There will be this diagonal term coming from this one, right? So that's the computer from from there and there will be this Delta star K star CK CK up at time tau uh, product with ck up dagger at time zero which is precisely g all right so this is a system of equations the equations of motions for for these two green's functions and they're coupled to each other and there's no other coupling to other green's functions so this is a closed system which is expected since it's a quadratic term now i can solve this this quadratic system especially if i go into frequency domain which is makes things easier so that's precisely what I'm doing here I take a Fourier transform of the whole thing say G I K N is a integral in beta d tau g tau e i k n tau and then uh, of course I can take the the inverse Fourier transform and notice that in the inverse Fourier transform the dependence is this e to the minus i k n tau so when I, whenever I take a derivative of g tau, there's a minus i k n there. Uh, I move this guy to that side, right? So there was this the derivative plus this term, right? And what I have here is that delta function that when I take the Fourier transform will uh, in here will give me one, right? Since these are uh, uh, much better frequencies ikn here in, in, in this case is in even number of uh, an odd number times pi over beta so uh, this will give me this the integral of the delta here will give me one and there will be this delta k and the Fourier transform of this okay now for the f is very similar there's this minus ik but now notice that there's a minus epsilon of minus k here right there's uh, everything is minus k and on the right hand side there will be delta k star times the the greens functions the electron greens functions and now of course this is all algebraic so i can uh, solve this the set of equations right it's just two by two i can do it in many ways for instance if i multiply the second line here by i k n plus epsilon k so i would get i k n squared minus epsilon k squared since epsilon k equals epsilon of minus k right uh depends on k square here so i get uh, so if multiplying this the second line by minus i k n plus epsilon k uh, I get here uh, delta k star times minus i k plus epsilon k times the Green's functions, which is equal to this. So I get minus delta k star times this minus one, right? Or delta k star times this minus one plus delta k star times delta k gets absolute value of delta times the f itself so if i now solve for f i got precisely the result that we had in the slide uh 
the denominator has i k n square minus epsilon k square plus delta absolute value of delta k square and the uh, the numerator ha has this minus delta k star so let's let's go back to the slide to 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 see that but essentially we we can derive those equations okay so we're back to the slide notice that this is precisely the, the expression for f that i was talking about minus delta k star i k n square minus epsilon k plus uh, absolute value of delta k squared and if you re substitute that in the expression for in the other equation on that system of equations for g you can solve for g and you get this notice again that the poles for the Green's functions and, and also for f are essentially at these energies capital e k which is capital E K square, right? So that's that's where the poles are. And so this is the square of the excitation's energies. So in a sense, that's how we diagonalize the Hamiltonian or at least get the, the, the energy spectrum from the, the mean field Hamiltonian by calculating the Green's functions. We look for the poles and, and those poles are give us the energies. All right, so how about the self-consistent uh, equation for, for delta? Let's take a look. So we rewrite now the expression for this delta minus sum over k prime v k k prime, then the absolute value of this, the Cooper pair operator. And uh, notice that if we go back Again, this is precisely f, but the I define the f with the dagger, so this is f star at a moment, momentum k prime at time tau equals zero, zero positive, right? So if we go back one slide, this is f, right? F star would be with all the daggers here at time equals zero, it would get just the time order would disappear and would get just minus the the average or the expected value, thermal expected value of C minus K down C K up. And that's precisely what we have here. So actually this is minus F. So that's why they get the plus here. And uh, yeah, that, that should give me the, the correct equations for the gap. So let's keep. So if I take uh, this form here of the delta, and particularly if I consider a case where this delta doesn't depend on K, is isotropic in K space, is so-called the S-wave pairing. It depends only on the temperature. I can get a very interesting analytic expression for the gap in a self-consistent way, which would then lead me to, to a dependence of the gap on the temperature. So I will start with this expression, get the expression for the F that we derived before, and then I'll arrive here. And I'll see that the solutions of this equation, essentially a transcendent, transcendental equation, will give me a curve like that. So let's see how does that work and it will be very instructive uh, uh, to see what's going on here and, and why this equation gives me so much information. Let's take a look. Okay, so let's start by this expression. Notice that the sum here is for k is such that the epsilon k in absolute value is less than omega d by. That's our definition for the potential. So uh, notice also that f involves the delta. So this is definitely a self-consistency equation. I calculate delta, go back, recalculate f, and so forth. Notice also that what appears here is that e k that we 
we found in the Bogolubov uh, transformation part, okay? So, which also depends on delta, right? So there you have delta on the right hand, uh, left hand side and delta on the right hand side. So let's keep going. Okay, now the point to realize here is that I have the f Matsubarak function, Green's functions, at tau equals zero. So I have to take a Fourier transform of this expression, which is written in the Matsubara frequency space. So when I write f up, down, up of the star, right? We need to take the star of k prime at tau equals zero plus, and this is is uh, an eta that I'm, I'm going to define that is a small positive number and take then they limit eta going to zero but it's going to be this 1 over beta sum over the mass of water frequencies e to the minus i chi n tau which is zero plus right or eta here times this and this is going to be there will be this minus sign here delta k not star right uh, there will be a minus i here but when, when you take the square it doesn't matter but yeah, let's just put it in here, small minus sign here, so that we, at least here we are all on the same page. There's a minus here, yeah, because this is star, okay? And then minus ek squared, right? Notice that this exponential of e minus ik in eta. And where eta is a number that's going to zero plus. Okay. Now what I can do is this. Notice that I can write this one over i k n square minus e k square as this w minus one over two e k plus 1 over 2 ek, this one divided by ikn plus ek, ikn minus ek. You can do the calculation and add these two, take the delta delta out so it doesn't uh, uh, bother you much. But if you add these two, essentially you, you get uh, precisely 1 over ikn squared minus ek squared. Okay? So that's a trick for, you know, now algebra trick to separate fractions of this of this kind and for us it's going to be very useful because we know how to do sums when you have some things like i to the i 1 over i omega much better frequency minus something right something like this and this you uh, if you go back to the class on Matsubara frequencies which I'm gonna uh, put a link up here you will see that uh, this is just the Fermi function at this energy E. Uh, you can look at this as a sum over residues, which is an integral in the complex plane, and then uh, these omegas are the poles of, of this, and right here now you're calculating this at the other pole, which is epsilon. So, uh, Essentially, it's, you, you transform this sum in, in an in a integral in a complex plane, and, and that's what you get. So it should be there in the class on Matsubara frequencies. So keep going, and now these will become then uh, Fermi direct distributions, one at energy epsilon ek, sorry, and another at energy minus ek. Notice that this difference, I can write both of them in terms of nf ek. I'm not going to use this nf minus efk. Let me, let me rewrite this this way. So this is yeah. You you can do this this simplification or right so this would be what e to the beta minus e k plus one and you can manipulate that to get one minus 
and this is 1 over e k plus 1, right? So you, you can manipulate this to get the sums. Uh, so I get, I write this as 1 minus 2 nf of ek, and then there's delta 2 ek. So, you know, very nice and elegant expression for f k prime tau equals 0 plus. And I, here I took the, I, I essentially took the, the limit of eta going to 0 when I did this Matsubara sum. All right. So let's keep going and, and finally I just now plug this into here. So I plug that into there, I get this, all right? And now the next step is to transform this sum in K into an integral in energy. And I do that by using the density of states, that's a trick, that's also uh, one of the hints in the assignment. So now this integral is going to be between minus omega d and plus omega d since this, this sum is up to energies which in absolute value are, are smaller than omega d. Okay, and here epsilon e, e k, which is this expression here, right? So I have both e k here in the denominator and inside the argument of the of the Fermi distribution. Now there's a couple tricks that we can do to this is already an, a transcendental equation but we need to know the, the density of states and I'm not going to argue that this is smooth enough uh, in within this range notice that omega d is much smaller than the Fermi energy so this can be taken out of the integral and uh, this has much more structure happening in, in this gap in, in this uh, in this range and so that we can do this this uh, extra simplification and also I'm gonna write this in terms of a hyper hyperbolic tangent and get the expression that we had in in the slide so let's see how, how we do that so this is what we had okay now I'm going to, as I mentioned, uh, notice that th this is the Fermi distribution. So one over minus two the times the Fermi distribution you can write as a, a hyperbolic tangent of this argument divided by two, right? Uh, and remember that e k uh, well e now because this is the the variable that which I'm integrating over is e square root of e epsilon square plus absolute value of delta square. So one more step and here we are. As I mentioned the approximation here is that I take the density of states of these of the electrons. Notice this energy is for the electrons, right? So this is the the density of states for the electrons and omega dy is much less than the Fermi energy. So uh, in this shell of omega dy around the Fermi energy I can take this, the argument is that this changes smooth, smoothly enough so that I can take it out of the integral and the other thing is that whatever is left here is all um, is is all even when when I change epsilon to minus epsilon so I can take this integral from minus omega d to omega d to twice the integral to 0 to omega d so there's a 2 here that's going to cancel with this 2 and that's the integral I'm left with okay and this is the expression that we had on the slide and I'm going to do one extra step so that we can, we can calculate this delta uh, self-consistently. So let's define f of delta t, which is this time minus this one, right? So this minus 1 equals 0. So that's the, the function that I'm defining, 
integral of zero to omega d by this tan this hyperbolic tan tangent here divided by square root of epsilon square plus delta square everything minus one so we want the solutions when this is equal to zero so this is a, a variable of two uh, a function of two variables so the surface or the line that is defined by f delta t equals zero gives the solutions for the self-consistent -consist solutions that we want. So let's write uh, a small script in Mathematica that illustrate this and gives us some some intuition on what the solutions these solutions look like. So let's go to a Mathematica a notebook. All right, so here we are. And um, now defining this function, uh, which is a function of delta and the temperature, right? Uh, and then is precisely what we had before, uh, which is rho v times the integral from uh, zero to omega d of this e is the variable of the hyperbolic tangent of the energy square root of e square plus delta square i here i put a, a small value here 10, 10 to the minus 10 so that this doesn't explode when when these things are, are zero and divided by the energy square root of e square plus delta square okay uh, define other functions here that uh, we'll talk about them later but uh, first i need to define the, the parameters so let's define omega the omega the by in and these let's call these units kelvin so this is kelvin all right which is a reasonable number for metal 100 kelvin now this is a, another trickier parameter is the the potential time is rho uh, i have really no no uh, intuition of what they should be but I, I chose this one which is much is smaller than one not much smaller but smaller than one and this will give me a, a reasonable a guess for tc which is coming from this these two expressions we'll we're, we're talk about them in a second but these are essentially uh, order of magnitude parameters that we can define. So I can define delta zero, so this de delta at zero temperature, and then the, the transition temperature by this 0 0.567 times this delta zero. And notice that this is essentially what we calculated before, two omega d exponential one minus this. So if I if I plug in these numbers, uh, for say. Uh, uh, omega d is 100 kelvin the tc that i get when i define it, all of these oops sorry here is 4 kelvin so that's tc and this delta zero which is in kelvin you can convert this to to electron volts or milli electron volts if you want uh, so this is like for uh, 4 kelvin which is reasonable for a superconductor bci superconductor right so this rho v 0 0.3 looks okay okay all right okay so what we want we want to look for self-consistent solutions of for delta which means zero zeros of this function for a given value of delta and certain temperature so let's start by taking say a guess for delta Let's start with a small value, right? 0 0.1 of this one. So it will be like the onset, a very small pairing energy, right? And the temperature that we expect to get when this function hits zero is very close to, to, to the, the transition temperature, which by our estimate here, I'm, I just you know didn't explain how I, I got this this expression but we we still see in this class but should be about four so let's plot this function for 0 0.1 delta as a function of temperature right 
and uh, see what we get. This is what we get. Oops, what did I do here? Let's put this. Yeah, that's the plot. All right, so this is the function for a given value of delta 0 0.1, and it goes smoothly as a function of temperature and it essentially hits zero around four. Okay, so it's a small value of delta, 10% of this value here. Uh, so it's everything is consistent, it's hitting um, the is hitting is reaching zero so delta for this temperature is about this value okay so okay so far so good now what we can do is this bunch of plots for different values of delta versus temperature and see uh say if delta here decreases i start with a large value of delta and go all the way to that small value delta that I plotted, just plot. So I, I'm plotting all these, these, uh, f doing all these curves, plotting all these curves, and I'm gonna be looking for the zeros in all of them. All right, so yeah, let's do that. Whole bunch of curves. Delta, 0 0.99, 0 0.99, 0 0.999, 0 0.99 times delta 0, 0.9, 0 0.7, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.1. So let's see what you get. There. Okay. So first one is uh, yeah, it's still plotting. First one, I got the zero uh, well below four. So this is that value of delta zero. Okay, so what, what I'm saying is that this is right for it. The delta will reach this value at a temperatures which are much smaller than that four Kelvin there, right? So this will be become bigger and bigger as the temperature decreases. So here, uh, this zero is already around, around one. So this is a sizable gap already. And I keep increasing, decreasing the delta, meaning that I'm increasing the temperature where this function crosses zero. So here's a little bit above one. Here's a bit more about, about one, but this is, see, I started with delta. This is 0.99 delta. So it is already a sizable, a very small difference in the gap, but it's already a sizable difference in the temperature, right? So, and I keep going. Now there's a much more sizable uh, increase in temperature, way more, and so on and so forth, until I v keep approaching this value of 4, right? So that's the last plot. And this is for 0 0.1, is precisely the, the other plot we had. All right. Now, the other thing we can do is instead of doing these 1D plots all the way and looking for, for these zeros, I could do is a three-dimensional plot for this, for versus delta and t, and see where it, it crosses the plane zero, right? And that's essentially what I'm, I'm going to do here. So let's go a little bit down here. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to plot t 3D of two surfaces, func of delta temp, right? And a surface which sits at zero for any values of delta and temp. And I'm, of course, changing delta and the temperature uh, between these, these parameters. And let's see what we get. From, so I should get two surfaces here, right? So let's see, it's calculating, yeah, that's what you get. So yeah, that's, these, these are the surfaces, okay? All right, so the, the yellow one is F of delta temp, and the blue one is zero. It's just a surface sitting at zero value here, okay? There. The line where the two surfaces cross 
is the solution to that transcendental equation that you want is f delta t equals zero right so this crossing defines a curve and that's a curve that we want so these values of deltas and these values of t corresponds to the the, the solutions that we are looking at so let's flip this and look at at, at the solution which is what is delta as a function of temperature so this surface here right this surface this curve is precisely the curve that we're looking at meaning what for temperatures larger than k there's no solution right so there is no crossing and 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 the delta never it, it is never above zero right so there is no uh, Cooper performation for temperatures larger than, than about four, right? Okay. Now, as I increase the decrease the temperature below four, then I, I have solutions, right? First, very very small values of delta zero, and then I, I keep increasing as the temperature decreases, and I go along this line until, for very small temperatures, this kind of reaches a plateau which is about, you know, this is seven, seven something, which is right on with that estimate that we had before, right? That I had here, way up there, 7.13, which is this. And notice that this is the Debye frequency times an exponential, right? So let's see how, we're, we're gonna talk in, in a bit how, how I got these numbers, but, this is the general behavior that the solutions for that transcendental equations look a lot more like this. Here, it, the delta saturates, and this is the maximum volume. So this is the maximum delta that you, that you can get, the maximum gap, or the maximum binding energy of my Cooper pairs. And it happens precisely at zero temperature. Here, something happens, right? So here, that's a transition. And this is remember this is a mean field so i i do get a transition but the details of what's going on here might not be very accurate but at least i get a qualitative picture of what's going on and what's going on is that below this temperature even for the simple model that, that we had we find a gap appearing in the spectrum and on, not only that this gap is related to the formation of cooper pairs so let's talk a little bit more about this this plot and uh, let's go back to the slide oh by the way i encourage you to to write a script like this either in mathematica or your favorite scripting language and play around with these numbers right uh, the omega d by and 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 rho v and c you what what do you, you what do you you get for tc and, and 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 delta here and you know just so to have some intuition on on this uh these numbers all right so having said that let's go back to the slide all right so as i mentioned we when we solve these equations in in and look for solutions for delta as a function of the temperature we get something like this right a diagram and this actually is not far from what the experiments will will give you uh, here we, we do have a TC and here we have a Delta and if you collapse the data uh, right renormalizing for the, the gap the measure gap and the, the transition temperature for uh, the onset of superconductivity in different metals such as tin or lead or indium you get a pretty great agreement with a curve like that. So the mean field is not too far off, okay? So at least it gives you, gets you uh, a very decent qualitative uh, behavior of the, the gap or the order parameters as a function of temperature. All right, so what else that can, can we learn from this rather simple model, right? It's just the constant V model that we have been using. 
is how do we estimate these parameters, at least TC and the maximum value of delta, right? So let's see how we do that. And precisely what, what I did in, in, the, in the script there. So let's take a look at this region here, when T goes to zero, right? And let's also use the fact that V of rho F is much less than one. Well, here you can show that in this case, omega zero will be around two omega d e to the minus one over v rho f. That's precisely what I wrote in the script. And we can we can, we can uh, quickly see that this is the case when we look at what's going on in the in the integral. So let's let's go to the blackboard and and see what we we have there. Okay, so let's take the case of t going to zero. Well, let's, let me use another pen here. Let me use the yellow one. t going to zero here. So for t going to zero, we have this hyperbolic tangent, right? This, this goes to zero. So this hyperbolic tangent of beta e k the argument goes to zero so this goes to one right so the hyperbolic tangent you can yeah it's just a sum of of the exponentials so this goes to one right and then what you have is that my function now f t going to zero is v rho at the FM energy times an integral of omega d d e over square root of minus one and you can evaluate this integral it will give you or look up if you want, but this will give you the inverse of the hyperbolic sine, so hyperbolic sine of omega d over delta, okay? So for f equals zero, it means that uh, v d or v rho e f times the oh sorry inverse of the hyperbolic sum of omega d divided by delta equals one or the omega d this is the same as omega d over delta equals to the sine hyperbolic sine of one over rho ef right you just go one over here and then take the sine hyperbolic in both sides, which is uh, e to the i one over v rho minus e to the minus one over v rho and divided by two. And if this rho v is much less than one, only this term will will survive because this one over this is going to be a large number. This goes to zero, goes to zero. So this is approximate uh, e to the one i rho v divided by two. All right, so that means that solving I get theta, the, uh, delta t equal going to zero. Yeah, there's no, well, 
of course is always positive right so that gives me about two times omega d two times omega d e to the minus one over v, v rho epsilon f which is the approximation that I used all right so that's the first approximation let's look at the other one in the slide all right so that gives me the the case where I have the zero temperature component so I have this approximation for delta zero which is the one I used in the script and now let's look at the, the critical temperature when this thing goes to zero right so I'm gonna argue that this will give me a, a critical temperature that is proportional to the delta zero in fact the uh, you can calculate the proportionality factor by this and this is the um, uh, Euler's constant so let, let's let's see how how this works in the blackboard and then we'll, we'll discuss how this value which is predicted by our very simple theory matches up with experimental values okay so we're back to the to the slide and now we want to take the limit of delta going to zero or t going to dc so essentially we're going to replace delta equals zero here and here and beta are replaced by beta c which is one over kbtc okay so uh, this plus one of course we're looking for the zeros here so one equals this uh, is v times rho at the the Fermi energy so let me put this in there times this integral where hyper hyperbolic tangent b bet beta c epsilon over 2 divided by epsilon right okay it turns out that for um, this integral you can solve for considering that first uh, tc is much smaller than omega d so you can integrate this by parts and of course you, you're going to get a log here all right and we, and there, there's going to be an, another integral you, which you can approximate and this other integral will give you something will be something like this uh, 0 to infinity log of u over hyperbolic cosine of u square du which gives a uh, log of pi over 4 minus gamma which is Euler's constant which is a number Euler's constant okay this will appear here when you, when you do this by parts so the net result I'm gonna leave for you for you to do it of the whole thing is that this integral will give uh, something like log of um, omega d over 2 kbtc so which is beta c omega d over 2 right minus this log of pi over 4 minus this constant okay all right so that's the end result here and I have very little space here so when once this equals zero and this equals one meaning that uh, yeah you, you let, let's do a, a simplification here and I'm gonna put this pi over 4 over here uh, 4 here and a pi there it's gonna be a 2 okay 2 and then a closed bracket here so would be something like this this is equal this will be equal to 1 when this is equal to 0 and then 
put in magenta here. So it's going to be 1 over V. Minus gamma, right? Or this is a sorry, this is this should be plus gamma, okay? This should be plus gamma, and there's going to be a minus gamma there equals log of. 2 omega d so over kbtc times pi and this gives me uh, kbtc equals uh, e times gamma right when I put it here divided by pi times the same delta zero that we had here times the same delta zero that we had there right which involves these two omegas an exponential of one minus one over rho epsilon so and this is so if you calculate this e, e to the elders constant divided by, by pi this is precisely uh, 1 over 3.53 times delta 0. All right, so this gives me, let me put it here, 2 or, well, actually there's a, sorry, sorry, let me, let me put this, this here. This is actually point five six seven seven delta zero and if you do the calculation this gives me that three point fifty three two delta zero over KBTC equals three point five three the end result here. All right. So that's the limit when delta equals zero. So let's go back to, to the slide and wrap this up. Okay, so we derived this. So everything is, is okay now. I, I have the, the two estimates that I used in my script. So you can now do your scripts as well and, and use these estimates as well to do your, your integrals and you should get this curve. And let me tell you that, you know, if you take these three metals and you calculate two times this divided by this KBTC, you'll get something very, very close to 3.53, 3.46. Here, lead is a little bit larger, 3.63 for indium and so on. So even though our model was very simple, it did capture some of the physics that happens in the superconductivity in metals. So this indicates a success of the theory, even at this level and this, this very basic level. Uh, of course, not all superconductors are described by BCS. I might record another video on that on this in the future. Uh, there are many many materials that uh, do not are not described by, by these electron phonon interactions. But at least these mechanisms of, of pairing of electrons, they may not form a Cooper pair singlet, but they may they might, might form other types of of excitations. Uh, it, it even for for those cases where BCS doesn't describe the superconducting behavior is really instructive to at least know the main ingredients of BCS. Uh, and so because it's a theory that works for very well for, for systems such as metals. Okay. All right. So that's it for this class. Uh, I'll see you next time. Bye bye.